Good morning, everyone. I would like to open here number 10 of the 185 ordinary period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is entitled Situation of Sexual and Reproductive Rights of Adolescents in the Region of the Caribbean. The hearing was requested by Center for Reproductive La Rights, Latin American Program, International Planned Parenthood Federation, Americans and the Caribbean. My name is Julissa Mantisha Van Colen. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Together with me are the second vice president of the Inter-American Commissioner, Commissioner Margaret May McCauley, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena de Truitinho, uh, that is a reporter for the rights of girls, boys, and adolescents, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Today with us are also the special reporter for economic, social, cultural, environmental rights, and Maria Claudia Pulido, Assistant Executive Secretary of the Commission. I would like to greet all the members of social of civil society, and I would like to explain allocation of time. The civil society will have 30 minutes, then the Inter-American Commission will have another 30 minutes, and then the civil society will have another 25 minutes to react and to comment on all the things that they were not able to present during the first round. So having said this, I would like to give the floor to the civil society. Thank you, Madam President. It's an honor for us to be here today. I would like to especially greet you and the other commissioners and the rapporteur and the assistant executive secretary of the commission. This intervention will be done by the English speaking Caribbean region. So our presentation will be in English. This was the consensus uh, reached by the petitioners. So I will begin. Uh, President, Commissioners, uh, Reporters, just, uh, good morning to all those present. Uh, my name is Carmen Cecilia Martinez. I am the Associate Director for Legal Strategies at the Latin American and the Caribbean Program of the Center for Reproductive Rights, and it is an honor to begin this presentation today. The center has been committed to guarantee that girls, adolescents, and young people have access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as the opportunity to exercise their sexual and reproductive autonomy according to their evolving capacities. After the litigation of Guzman Alvarazin case versus Ecuador, for the first time, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights recognized that sexuality and reproductive education is a right that its states must ensure across the region. The adolescents and young people from the Caribbean region, IPPF, and the Center for Reproductive Rights requested this hearing to share our concerns about the current state of the sexual and reproductive health and rights in the Caribbean region, particularly the lack of comprehensive sexuality education and contraceptive methods. The Caribbean has the slowest trend of decline of adolescent birth rates in all the world. One of five births in the Caribbean is to a teen mother. Maternal conditions are the third leading cause of death of adolescents between 15 and 19 years in the Caribbean. Almost half of Caribbean young people from eight countries do not demonstrate accurate knowledge about HIV prevention and transmission. This is especially worrisome since the Caribbean region has countries that continue to criminalize abortion in all circumstances in violation of human rights standards. During this hearing, we aim to provide the Inter-American Commission with updated information of countries such as Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, as well as the perspective of young activists of the region. I would like to express our gratitude to the commissioners, reporters, and the staff of the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission for giving us the opportunity to share these regional findings and give voice to young people. I will now give the floor to them so that they can address this situation. Uh, thank you very much.
I think yes, Chris uh, Chris Ann is is will will have the word just right now. Thank you. Chris Ann, can you hear us? Are you, am I being heard? Okay. Good morning, distinguished guests and listeners. My name is Chris Ann Knight, and I am the youth representative on the board of directors for the Jamaica Family Planning Association. This organization, which I'm most proud to be a member of, is a non-government and non-profit organization that has operated in Jamaica since 1957. The association operates within national policy guidelines to provide a variety of sexual and reproductive health services, as well as to provide outreach and support to some of our most vulnerable groups in Jamaica, especially in regard to adolescents. I would like to share with you a story. This story is about Candice, a then 14 year old girl who was enjoying the pleasures of a sexual relationship with a man whom she had considered at that time to be her 22 year old boyfriend. A sexual relationship without the use of contraceptives as she had no knowledge of such, coupled with the recurring thought that she believed she was too young to have a baby, so she wouldn't really get pregnant anyway not to mention the risk of STIs and STDs, as Candace had never given those topics even a passing thought. She commented to herself, I was a virgin before this, so I'm basically good. As life would have it, she would stand corrected as she found out she was pregnant while vomiting in the girls' bathroom of her high school auditorium. Crippled by fear and anxiety, with no one to turn to, nor any resources at her disposal, she was faced with the daunting task of informing the father of the child. The conversation was anything but pleasant, and quite frankly, everything but a conversation. As Candace was met with fists, slaps, kicks, and various vicious words breaking her already fragile spirit, she held on to the thought that maybe this will cause the baby to go away, or better yet, maybe I will go, maybe I will go away with the baby. This story and countless stories like this are painfully common as these are the realities of persons in the Caribbean and Jamaica face daily. The main issues highlighted for Candace is the access to contraceptives. And she, like thousands of other youth, here in Jamaica are being significantly disadvantaged as a result of a lack of access to contraceptives. Some of the factors affected by access to contraception that are most drastically being impacted within our adolescent populations today are the rates of HIV transmission and other sexually transmitted diseases, the rate of sexually transmitted infections, pregnancy rates, prevalence of unsafe and safe abortions, loss of income, mortality rates, mortality rates resulting from the disease, resulting from suicide, and resulting from homicide. If the most fundamental of each of these issues, such as access to contraception, contraception is not effective, it will easily be expected to see increases in all the factors related to that issue. From Candice's story alone, she was at risk at, for all five factors. Therefore, the solutions to this problem must be implemented to protect our youth now. Candice would make one in the 22,000 persons who receive abortions yearly in Jamaica. And poor women face the greatest risks with backstreet procedures and self-administered drugs, according to the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. This in light of the fact that abortion is in fact illegal in Jamaica under the Offenses Against the Person Act of 1864. However, thousands of others may very well be suffering in silence, in fear of discrimination, and would not be accurately represented in the statistic quoted above. 
It is also imperative to note that according to the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the National HIV, STI and Tuberculosis Pro Program, HIV is transmitted through sexual intercourse as seen with 91% of cases with a known transmission category. There were 1,197 new cases in 2017. The national HIV and AIDS case rate for 2017 is 43.9 cases per 100,000 population. Moreover, the incidence of transmission was found to be across the board for all STIs, STDs, and HIV, higher in the urban areas and highest in the capital city here in Kingston in Jamaica. With the youth population between the ages of 15 to 24 accounting for up to 40% of this population, it is safe to say we have an acute worsening of a long-standing problem. The age group 20 to 29 year olds represents the highest diagnosed cases for both male and female, 160 and 149 cases respectively. The decrease in condom use among persons in the 14 to 24 and the 25 to 49 age group, as noted in the 2017 Knowledge, Attitudes and Behaviour Survey, may have contributed to the high level of diagnosed cases in the 20 to 29 age group. This clearly depicts that our youth are engaging in sexual practices well before the age of consent, which in Jamaica is 16 years old for males and females. I challenge my government as having legally granted persons the right to participate in sexual activities. How then do you explain not affording them the resources to participate in these same activities responsibly? As products of our resource strained healthcare sector, it can be understood why only 40% of diagnosed persons are able to access triple therapy for HIV treatment and transmission rates are reaching levels of 13%. In the place of stringent legislation that does not provide access to safe abortion, it is almost expected that the majority of persons who seek abortions are left with serious medical complications and 5% resulting in death. 18% of all births in Jamaica occur to teenagers, such as Candice, and placing Jamaica at the highest third highest adolescent pregnancy rate in Latin America and the Caribbean, as stated by the United Nations Populations Fund Subregional Office for the Caribbean. These consequences are as a result of ineffective and appropriate resources geared towards sexual and reproductive health rights. Many, if not all of the problems, would become less heinous with proactive strategies to improve the access to contraceptives. These proactive solutions within, would involve access to contraception method, method, mesh, method, sorry, both invasive and non-invasive for all persons with special attention to delivery to youth through youth empowered spaces and competently trained health professionals. Secondly, it would implore on my commissioners to implore on our governments to increase the funding to create, integrate comprehensive sexuality education practices into the health and family life education curriculum and to engage all education levels in training to equip teachers to provide relevant and age appropriate information outside of the biologic or religious based views. And lastly, to create a national level social or behavioral workshop geared to create the foundation of effective communication as it relates to sexual and reproductive health between children and family, students and teachers, and healthcare providers and youth. This is aimed at removing the taboo in having these discussions and to empower our youth to speak up in any situation, as well as to improve the sexual education level and to maximize the use of resources that will become available to them. My commissioners, you have heard Candice's story and countless others like hers. Now, how will you help us? Madam President, Commissioners. Thank you. I am Dennis Lord, 25 years old and a member of the board of the Family Planning Association of Trinidad and Tobago, a leading civil society organization that seeks to advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights, fight against gender-based violence in all forms through education, and the defense of all rights of all people.
I speak to you today against the backdrop of one major area of thematic concern, which has far-reaching implications. That is the role of comprehensive sexuality education in addressing sexual and gender-based violence, child sexual abuse, and as a factor in discrimination against people on real or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. As a nation, Trinidad and Tobago has received a large number of gender-related recommendations during both the first and second cycle of the UPR, the majority of which focus on sexual and gender-based violence, including domestic violence and marital rape, sexual harassment, child, early, and forced marriage, and harmful practices. The government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago supported all 18 recommendations related to sexual and gender-based violence, but unfortunately noted one recommendation on prohibiting the marital rape of minors, and six of the seven recommendations to eliminate early, forced, and child marriage. Our state is party to numerous international human rights conventions. Our international obligations require us to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health information, education, services, rights, and of course, the right to a life free from sexual and gender-based violence. Madam President, I'll now offer to the Commission two recommendations, and after which I'll explain why. The information which we are about to present is nothing new and has been presented at numerous international fora over the years. But this session of the IACHR presents a unique opportunity for you to encourage the government of Trinidad and Tobago to take stronger action to protect the rights of all people with particular focus on youth in the face of a challenge changing society and consider and act on the following recommendations. One, we ought to revise the existing HFLE curriculum to bring it in line with international guidelines on sexuality education and dedicate funding for ongoing training of facilitators and implementation of the curriculum for all primary and secondary students. And two, CSE must, must and ought to be complemented by access to the full range of comprehensive sexuality services, which are currently prohibited in Trinidad and Tobago for all persons under the age of 18. This can have a bolstering bi-directional relationship role in supporting positive health-seeking behavior of young people with the implementation of minors' access to sexual health services. It means that those young people, even those that are out of school, who do not have access to CSE, can still access education critical for their rights and health. This must also be aided by the removal of the mandatory reporting requirement for healthcare providers. Madam President, comprehensive sexuality education empowers young people with information and education about their sexual and reproductive health so that they are able to decide freely and responsibly matters related to their sexuality, free from coercion, discrimination, and violence. It goes beyond biological information to include value creation around human rights, gender equality, which are key to combating root causes of gender-based discrimination and violence, including those against people based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. CSE provides children and young people with age-appropriate and phased education based on human rights, gender equality, dignity, relationships, reproduction, sexual behaviors, risks, and the prevention, protection from ill health, and emphasizes values such as respect, inclusion, non-discrimination, equality, empathy, and reciprocity. The major pillars of CSE play a key role in preventative action against violence in all forms. As a party, the Montevideo Consensus, Trinidad and Tobago, committed to ensure effective implementation from early childhood of comprehensive sexuality education programs recognizing the emotional dimension of human relationships with respect to the evolving capacity of boys and girls and the informed decision of adolescents and young people regarding their sexuality from a participatory, intercultural, gender sensitive, and human rights perspective. Admittedly, Trinidad and Tobago does have a current HFLE curriculum. However, upon objective evaluation of the curriculum, it scores only 24% when analyzed by the Sexuality Education Curriculum Review and Assessment Tool for Latin America, developed by UNESCO, which demonstrates that the HFLE curriculum in Trinidad and Tobago lacks legal framework, programmatic commitments, reporting mechanism, 
adequate training for facilitators, outreach campaigns, sufficient budget allocations, and only meets a stark 53% of curricular content requirements. Importantly, in June 2017, our parliament unanimously passed legislation to outlaw child marriage through the amendment of various marriage and divorce laws, changing the legal age of marriage to 18 years. This legislation, of course, brings our law in alignment with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which Trinidad and Tobago is a party. However, while the age of marriage has changed, it has serious repercussion on the rights of young people to access sexual and reproductive health services. Without access to these services, young people do not have the ability to access the commodities they need to exercise their human rights and to health and bodily autonomy. Serious concerns related to sexual and reproductive health of young people arise from the results of the Trinidad and Tobago School Climate Report on bullying gender-based violence in secondary schools. Most concerningly were the outcomes related to sexual violence. Data from nine Caribbean countries indicated that 47.6, a stark 47.6% of females and 31.9% of males described their first intercourse as either forced or coerced and held family members or persons known to the family as responsible. 100 students reported some form of sexual violence with some 15 females and 28 males being unsure of whether their initial experiences were described as molestation or rape. CSC enables young people to make informed decisions about relationships and sexuality and navigate a world where their health and well-being are still threatened by serious risks. In Trinidad and Tobago, it will act to prevent and address harmful social and cultural patterns, eliminate prejudices, gender inequalities, and other root causes of sexual and gender-based violence, and ensure that all people understand and can exercise their human rights and bodily autonomy. It will undoubtedly have positive impact in reducing negative outcomes such as sexually transmitted infections and HIV and AIDS, including a, a issue that we face throughout the Caribbean of unplanned pregnancy. Not only does CSC address the root causes of sexual and gender-based violence and discrimination against women and girls, but it also gets to the root cause of discrimination against people based on their real or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. LGBTI people are often targeted with violence and discrimination because they are perceived as departing from societal norms that dictate gender expression and sexual behavior. Due to our restrictive legal framework, hate crimes against people based on real or perceived sexual orientation, gender, identity, and expression are not recognized, and as such, there is no reliable country data on the prevalence of such. However, uh, we know, based on reports from UNESCO, Trinidad, the UNESCO, uh, in partnership with the Silver Lining Foundation, uh, the report outlined that LGBTI people, it in LGBTI people um, experience increased levels of verbal, physical, sexual, and cyberbullying at higher rates than non-LGBT students. Madam President, Commissioners, in my summary, we are imploring you to take the opportunity to, of course, engage with the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to find mechanisms in which we can address issues of comprehensive sexuality education and provide a fair playing field for all young people in Trinidad and Tobago, boys, girls, and those marginalized communities. Thank you. Good morning, honorable commissioners, our listening audience, and our esteemed panelists. My name is Donna Da Costa Martinez, the Deputy Regional Director of the International Planned Parenthood Federation of Americas and the Caribbean region. Created in 1962, IPPF is locally owned and globally connected with a network of over 130 member associations, united by a common goal that all people, especially women, girls, gender diverse people, and youth, have access to quality and affordable sexual and reproductive health information and services without fear, discrimination, violence, or coercion. In 2021, IPPF delivered 231.4 million sexual and reproductive health services and contributed to 120, 
21 policy and legal changes toward the advancement of sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. I'm here today, myself, a Caribbean woman from Trinidad and Tobago, accompanying Chris Ann and Dennis, two young people representing two of IPPF's long, longest standing member associations and who have a combined experience in the field of sexual and reproductive health spanning 131 years. For 70 years, IPPF has been steadfast in advocating for the rights of all people. The world is home to the largest generation of young people in history. They are diverse, they have opportunities, but they also face immense obstacles in their lives. As you have heard today, young people and adolescents need to be able to make informed decisions and have access to sexual and reproductive health education, information and services by genuinely focusing on young people's health, rights and well-being facilitating meaningful youth engagement and avoiding tokenism. We can deliver sustainable services, program and interventions that are truly shaped by them and thus are relevant, inclusive and effective. We appeal to you, honorable commissioners, to use all the powers of your esteemed office to amplify these voices in the best interests of these young people. We appeal to you to encourage our member states, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago in particular, to support the creation of an enabling environment for sexuality education in their respective countries by affirming that the right to education includes the right to sexuality education and that sexuality education contributes to the achievement of gender equality, the prevention of gender-based violence, and the improvement of health and well-being of young people. The long-term benefit is to reduce the exorbitant cost to the health sector that will emerge if we do not address these human rights issues, and not to mention the spiraling effect on the quality of life for our young people. We are reminded of Carmen's earlier comment that states must ensure Guzman Albarracin's standard after the litigation of Guzman Albarracin case versus Ecuador. For the first time, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights recognized that sexuality and reproductive education is a right that states must ensure across the region. And we would like you to highlight this in your intervention with our states. Too often in the Caribbean, beliefs about the effects of teaching young people about sexual health and well being are misconstrued by a powerful opposition who reject evidence based approaches. This allows comprehensive sexuality education to be a highly politicized and hotly debated issue without due consideration to the adverse effects that lack of education and access always bring. This is further compounded by the lack of accurate data in our countries and makes it impossible for effective advocacy for the implementation of the necessary policies and legislative changes. We ask you to urge our governments to remove barriers that prohibit sexually active young people from accessing sexual and reproductive health services, including access to contraceptives. This includes lowering the minimum age of consent to sexual intercourse, considering the recommendation of the evolving capacity and autonomy of adolescents and young people, thereby enabling such access. It is no longer a secret that young people are sexually active before the established age of consent in our respective countries. We request of you, dear commissioners, to follow up on these recommendations with our various states. And we also invite you to visit one of our countries, Trinidad and Tobago or Jamaica, to evaluate this information shared with you today and to obtain firsthand the realities of our young people in our countries. We are all too familiar with the saying that youth are our future. 
But today I want to go a step further to say, youth are the present, youth are now. Young people's intra and intergenerational relationships and transitions in their unique cultural and political context influence their health seeking behaviors as they grow up and must be considered when developing programs for you. Their needs are real and urgent. So right here and now, IPPF pledges its continued support for the recommendations put forward today for the promotion and delivery of age appropriate, gender sensitive, comprehensive sexuality education for in and out of school youth and for, the in, and for ensuring access to contraceptives. In closing, I wish to thank the Center for Reproductive Rights for their continued partnership with IPPF and for requesting this important hearing to shine light on the sexual and reproductive health concerns of Caribbean youth. On behalf of the young people who brought before you this, these concerns, and on behalf of all the young people in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean, I thank you, honorable commissioners, for your keen interest and for giving them the opportunity. Last, but certainly not least, I thank Trisan and Dennis for embracing this opportunity today to act as a voice for all young people in the Caribbean and beyond, and for the very eloquent manner in which they share their concerns. To close, I share a quote by Audrey Lord, and at last, you'll know with surprising certainty, surpassing certainty, that only one thing is more frightening than speaking your truth, and that is not speaking. The International Planned Parenthood Federation, Americas and Caribbean region will continue to support the voice and choice of youth today, tomorrow, and always, because to do less, we would be failing in our responsibility to our young people. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Donna, and to each and every one of you. Before giving the floor to my colleagues, I want to acknowledge, I want to thank Chrisan and Dennis and your voices are your bringing here today who will be heard by the commission. So first, I'll give the floor to second vice president, Commissioner Margaret McCauley, if she has any comments. Um, thank you, Madam President, and good morning, um, my sisters and brothers from the Caribbean. I'm very happy to hear from you this morning, even though it's about a very trying and long lasting uh, um, issue, which we all know and have all worked at. Um, indeed, I did so for my many years of, as a volunteer in the civil society in Jamaica. I, everything you said is true. It is indeed true. And over the years, efforts have been made in, in some countries more than in others to try to repair the ills um, which have been continuing against our young people. Um, and not only the girls, more the girls, and in lots of instances, the young boys. Um, because we have a situation also wherein a boy of 15 and a girl of 15 are in a sexual relationship. And the boy of 15 or 16 would be charged with a criminal offense because of his relationship with a girl. Now this, this the, I know the women's movement in Jamaica and in other, other Caribbean countries have been working. Um, to remove this because it is a quite quite a different circumstance when it's an, a man of 42 a man of in his 30s or late 20s having sex with a girl of 15 it's quite different he should be charged clearly but when two young people are experiencing their hormonal changes 
you cannot criminalize the boy, which is what has been happening. And, and it really has to stop. And the thing is that we need to educate, not only boys and girls, well, we need to educate every citizen in each of our countries because society itself imposed their cultural beliefs. There is a belief that if a man has an STD and has sex with a virgin, he will be cured. And therefore, lots of these young girls are raped by men in that situation. And we all know that the uh, um, success rate of investigating and prosecuting successfully such offenses is low. Sometimes I'm amazed at the results that jury, juries uh, uh, bring out after a trial of not guilty in circumstances which seem patently clear. But somehow in sexual offenses, it's difficult to get a successful conviction. And so society needs education and society needs information. That being so, I think we can all, all, all agree in that because adults, some adults are the biggest culprits of refusing to permit their children to be, receive information and education so that they can better understand their bodies. But I wanted to ask a couple of questions and I really thank you for your absolutely superb presentations this morning. And, and one of them is, I wanted to ask you if you can give more specific information as to the current laws in each of the countries which relate to sexual uh, um, activity and, and, and sexual reproductive rights and sexual reproductive health, um, because there are some, and, and the, the laws which are relevant, not the old laws, because there have been amendments in the region. And so that, and, and, and then give us your critique or otherwise of the existing laws. And also I wanted to ask whether the Jamaican um, situation, whether the organization is aware of a ministerial policy, which was put in place in the late 1970s by the then minister of health and which I know has never been removed, uh, um, which permits um, the access to abortion in all government hospitals and all government clinics. The only condition being that if a young woman is under 17, that young woman seeking such a, a procedure should be accompanied by a parent. That I know, that many people do not speak about this, but I've always done so over the years, both, both on air, meetings, uh, in groups, and in writing. It is still in place. I, I, do, I, I know it has not been removed. And also there was a cabinet uh, um, policy set in place for young women, and boys to receive, go to their medical uh, professional, to ask questions about their sexual reproductive rights, receive answers, seek advice on, on contraceptive, contraceptives and otherwise from them without parental consent and under the, the cover of confidentiality. That I know is, is also still in place. But, but there is a lack of general knowledge because the government is not putting it in the public domain as it should. But there are organizations who, which have information. And also, if you could tell me 
whether the family planning clinic, uh, family planning uh, um, department here still in Jamaica, they, it used to give to anyone who goes there without any questions asked, contraceptives. I don't know whether that's still in place. Perhaps we can get information on that if you have it. Um, and then, I mean, uh, uh, um, assuming that and accepting the fact that education and the rights to information are rights, uh, um, I think all our, uh, the governments in not only the Caribbean, but in Latin America as well, we're all guilty of the fact that enough is not being done in this area. And so how do you think, you've asked us to do something, how do you think we could act otherwise? Because the commission has always been trying to get states to do these things. Do you have any ideas as to how we should change and and deal with the issue of convincing states about how they can succeed in this area of informing and educating not only the young people, but the citizens, all the citizens in their country to change the mindset of everyone and respect the rights of all in relation to sexual reproductive health and uphold their dignity and their autonomy over their bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Now I would like to know if Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena has any comments to make. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to respectfully greet and to express my solidarity with all of you. I'd like to especially thank all the organizations I think that we have four organizations today and they have shared with us uh, very important pieces of information. I'd like to begin by making a comment recognizing the Center for Reproductive Rights because the case of Paola Guzman Alvarazin against Ecuador has raised a flag when it comes to education and sexual education, which is a right for all boys, girls, and adolescents, but also it's also an obligation on the side of the state. And the state, therefore, it's committed to using this mechanism, to use this tool, this right, to ensure everything that Chris, Anne, and Dennis have mentioned as a need that states have, they need to identify how powerful education is because it empowers boys, girls, and adolescents when it comes to this side on their sexuality, which is a part of human, of being a human being. But also, this is a tool to face uh, and identify any conditions related to abuse and violence, and to be able to overcome the fears that adolescents have in this regard. So. I wanted to recognize what Donna was saying, the right to education that is related to the right to health, the health of girls, boys, and adolescents, and all the effects that derive from not having access to this. I also would like to highlight two important aspects that were mentioned. Dennis was talking about child marriage, which is protected and the law still. I would like to know if you have any research study or if you have any program 
or any organization within your organization or within your countries that is addressing the criminal type of child marriage. Because if it's child marriage, what is happening is that there is rape or sexual violation. This is not a marriage. And secondly, I would like to know the stance of governments in the Caribbean. I would like to know the stance of the states when it comes to what Donna was explaining to us. She was talking about these regressive trends or opposing trends that are against sexual education and comprehensive sexual education. I'd like to know if in your states and through the different responsible authorities, including the health minister, education ministry, or those agencies that work with children, I would like to know if there is any type of protection or actions aimed at addressing the right to health and to education, the right to reproductive and sexual health services, if the states are providing these services. You were asking about what we can do. And I think that for that, we need to have the information you have. And with that information, we can have the possibility of requesting more information uh, in some areas. Um, because you are the ones who have identified the barriers that prevent this right to education to be realized. You, you know, you have identified also the right to comprehensive educational, uh, sexual education and the barriers that access to this right. And also, you know about the effects of the, this lack of access to rights. I would like to say also that the Center for Reproductive Rights, together with some important organizations in Ecuador, they have created the Observatory Paola Guzman Albarracin. And this is going to be a very important space so that the countries in the Caribbean have a place to inform about the actions that are being conducted, but at the same time, they will be monitoring the states and how they comply with their obligations when it comes to the obligations related to the treatment treaties that they have subscribed to. And I have another question and another comment. Girls, boys, and adolescents are the present. This is something that Donna was highlighting. This is here and now. And now and here we need to give them responses. I believe is that the answer has to do with empowering boys and girls. And if they are empowered, they will be able to actively participate and to express their opinions, to be heard, to be considered, and their progressive autonomy will be respected. Thank you so much for all the support that your organizations provide. That would be all, all on my side, Mr. Ms. Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Now I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Thank you, Madam President. After listening to you and after listening to my dear colleagues, uh, Commissioner Macaulay, Commissioner uh, Arosemena, and I'm sure that the President, Commissioner Mantilla, and the special rapporteur have a lot to say on, on this matter. What I want to take, I, I, I ask for the floor uh, in order to say a few things. First of all, I want to comment on your work. I want to commend the Center for Reproductive Rights here represented by my friend Carmen Cecilia Martinez, and also to you, members of the International Planned Parenthood Association Federation for the work that you are doing. The commission has been 
um, uh, working as making efforts in order to devise a sp special program of work for the Caribbean. And with this, this hearing, you are putting before us a very important issue that we have to address in particular. The question of uh, sexual uh, education, sexual health, sexual reproductive uh, in, in the Caribbean should be inserted as a priority in our program of work for the Caribbean for the, re the reason you have just uh, mentioned. Second, I think that one of the, the most important things that we have to address here has to do with uh, uh, sexual education. As uh, it has already been mentioned, the landmark uh, ruling by the Inter-American Court on the Albaracin Al Al case. But I think uh, it is very important to promote this right to education and this right to sexual education. But in here, I, I, I think uh, it's important that uh, the right to education be given to, boy, to both boys and girls. This is not just a matter for the, for the uh, concern of, uh, of uh, teenagers, of girls' teenagers, a matter of concern for, for uh, all society, for boys, girls, and also for, for their parents. There's a lot that we have to do in order to change uh, cultural conceptions, uh, laws, uh, practices, but we have to start for, for the basic. And the, and the basic is that in these issues, there must be an equal participation of, uh, uh, of uh, boys and girls, uh, uh, men and, and, and women alike. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, one of the questions that you have posed to, to us is, I think is very pertinent. What can the commission do uh, in order to support your work? And I think that uh, with your help, uh, highlighting the, uh, the relevance of this subject, we have to get closer to um, uh, the executive authorities, but also to the legislative authorities. Commissioner Macaulay mentioned all the important key uh, uh, legislative aspects that have to be addressed in order to make, to make a, a, a change. I'm, I just want to, to conclude by posing two, uh, two questions. One has to do with um, the, um, the right to, uh, to, to receive a, a, a contraceptive um, a, 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 se me fue la palabra en inglés, uh, to, to contraception. And here, I would like to know what's your, um, uh, your um, what's the situation of the use of the morning after pill in, 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 in your countries? And also what's the situation of the legally interruption of, uh, of pregnancy? Uh, especially because one of the concerns that you have mentioned is the rising number of adolescent pregnancy uh, in your countries. And here, this is something of too much concern because we are facing many times situation of rape or situation of uh, uh, um, um, sexual violence against, uh, against uh, uh, girls. So those things would help me personally to have a, 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 um, a complete uh, um, a picture of what's going on in the Caribbean. Thank you. Gracias, Presidenta. Muchas gracias. Uh, well, first of all, thank, thank you, you very much for your presence here, uh, Carmen, Donna, Denis, Pisans, because uh, Pisan, because you are the voices of many people uh, that needs to be heard. I'm speaking in English, even though I know that we have translation, but because there are many people who could be in touch with the hearings and they don't have translation, so I'm going to do my best in this. This is the first thing. Second of all, I was thinking, listening to you and listening to my colleagues, how of the how the commission can do many things. Um, uh, and, and I'm glad that my my dear Maria Claudia Police is there because we are preparing our next plan, a strategic plan. And there are many things that we can start doing. First, first of all, a specific press release on these issues in the Caribbean, not only in general, but in the Caribbean with all the lack of information that, uh, that, that you mentioned now, with all the cases, with the importance of hearing, first of all, teenagers, young people directly, uh, uh, sexual education as an integral issue 
in the whole uh, in public policies on education and issues like that. I think that the press release on that, it would be good to be released uh, by the commission. Second of all, uh, the inter-American system, as you know, had a lot of standards on this. Paola Guzman Albarracín, Atala case, Duque case, a lot of cases of LGTB uh, people rights and uh, sexual education and rights of children and rights of women. And I think that because we have a lot of, um, sorry, <laughs> with that, we, we, we have, um, we are going to have a, very soon a seminar on the Caribbean with the Caribbean authorities. We, are, we could, uh, you know, present this standard from the inter-American system to the Caribbean. And here I'd like to mention two issues. There are people, uh, countries in the Caribbean who has ratified some of the treaties, not all of the treaties. And this is the reality, but American declaration is part of the, uh, the cost of derecho consuetudinario, no? And the uh, prohibition of discrimination is a just cohesive norm, imperative norm, is even more important than treaty. So there are standards, there are information, there are things that we, as an inter-American commission, as part of our work, you know, on cooperation and teaching and training, we could uh, share with the Caribbean countries. Uh, as you know, um, last year, no, this year, we have a specific hearings on the rights of uh, sexual reproductive rights on children and girls from Ecuador. And we mentioned, even though it was the, the mother of Paula Guzman Albarracín in the hearing, and they create, as my colleague Esmeralda mentioned, this specific, specific focus on this observatorio in Ecuador. So I think this is a good practice that through the commission, we can share this with the Caribbean countries, you know, and a specific report on this situation in the Caribbean and a specific, um, you know, a space for teenagers, children to talk about that, you know, and I'm just uh, uh, giving general ideas, but I, <laughs> the compromise, I commit to have a specific meeting with this with my colleague to have like a specific steps to work for the Caribbean. As Commissioner Hernandez mentioned, we have a strategy for the Caribbean with many topics that are important. One of them is the promotion of the Inter American standard, the promotion of the ratification of treaties, but the gender-based violence, reproductive rights, access uh, to the morning pill, uh, 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 and all these things leading uh, issues related to sexual and reproductive health, should be present as human rights issue. It's a human right issue. It's not only something that should be, it's a human right issue, there are international standards, so the commission could do that. So the other thing that I'd like to, to, to you mentioned that, but I'd like to, to hear more, is about the gender stereotypes, the myths, the taboos, you know, all these issues that are impeding that women and girls and teenagers access to, to the information, you know. What kind of specific difficulties present Denise, the young people is confronting, even though all that you mentioned in general, if you can share more specific experiences of your stories uh, that, that could be useful for, for us to listen, not only for us, but for all the people who are now listening to the hearing. Uh, this will be for me and um, I uh, ask yes, uh, uh, Soledad Garcia, our special reporter, would like to share. Gracias, Presidenta. No me si hay traducción. No sé Thank you, Madam President. Should I speak in English? Uh, is there interpretation into English? Yes, that is. So I'll speak, I'll speak in Spanish then. I want to congratulate the Commission for having convened this hearing and I want to congratulate all participants of this hearing. This is very important because it refers to sexual and reproductive rights. As it has very well said, these are at risk of setback in many parts of the Americas. This is very important for my ra special rapporteurship because it's deeply connected, as the commissioners have very well explained, with the right to education and the right to health. 
also with the right to education for health and the right to and to have access to comprehensive sexual education. So having said this, I wanted to ask of you if you have any more information on any good practices that there may be uh, in your countries, maybe this is not public, but it's uh, good practices in the framework of civil society organizations. It could it will be very important for the Commission to hear more about those um, proposals. And also, I would like to know what are the main obstacles and the main challenges that you face as regards access to education and contraception, both at an educational level and the level of right to access to health. And of course, we will have a press release and we will be available uh, from the rapporteurship to contribute to the commission. Thank you very much. I give the floor back to the civil society. Uh, dear Donna, do you want to yes. start? Yes, I'm going to start, sorry. Um, thank you very much, commissioners. There's a lot of questions um, and a lot of information which we can share. Um, I want to also have the opportunity after our session to reconvene with our youth representatives so that we can give you in a more precise and concise manner, very targeted um, responses to your questions. However, I want to say that generally, um, one of the major problems that we experience is, um, has to do with the laws that exist in our various countries. What, for instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, the age of consent, it is, it is considered, um, it is considered um, that any child under 16 years of age cannot in law give consent to sexual intercourse and a wide range of other sexual activities. Um, what happens though, is that they are become more vulnerable to sexual violence and sexual exploitation because it is a criminal offense for anyone to have sexual intercourse with a child who is under 16 years of age. However, we know through various pieces of research that have been conducted, that young people are becoming sexually active earlier than 16 years of age. And this is a general statement that we can make across the board in our, in our countries. I think as well that Dennis, we have the two young people present here who would be, have been interacting with programs with young people who could also um, testify to these statements. Um, the other issue that we have is that so therefore, what is happening is young people, um, because of the law, cannot access the, the services that they require when they become sexually active, they are put at risk. We have the other problem on the other side with respect to the service providers. In the government health clinics, the, 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 the healthcare providers tend to stick with the law, which states, that you are committing an offense if you are if, if you are being if you are involved in sex and they threaten young people to report them and so what happens is young people go on the ground they hide they look for different ways to access what they could access they end up sometimes when they become pregnant they um they access um unsafe um, ways of, of, of terminating their pregnancies. Um, you have situations, for instance, where because they speak to their friends, they get information from their friends, they tend to use methods that their friends may have used in terms of terminating a pregnancy, for instance, which puts them at very high risk. The problem, the, the problem is we are not recognizing in our countries that young people have the right 
to access, um, to have education, sexuality education. So that even if, if health and family life education is being promoted within the school systems, it is not comprehensive enough to address the current issues of our youth in our various, in our various, um, in, in our various countries. So, so one of the things is that there have, you know, young people have been advocating that we take a look at the HFLE curriculum and to see how that curriculum can be adjusted to include some of the more um the more the topics that they require that should be addressed. For instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, I know that um, a couple of years ago, they sought to take, they had set up a committee and sought to take a look at, um, at the um, it's all one curriculum, which is a more comprehensive um, um, document that speaks to all the current issues of young people and how they should be addressed. So what they did from forms three to five, they take one element, which is sexual health, one element to, to, to strike a, an agreement that, that something is being done, but it's not sufficient to meet the new needs of our young people in the system. So, so more work has to be done um, to encourage um, to encourage the health, ministries of health, ministries of education to be to take control and to also know that they have a responsibility to young people when it comes to providing education, when it comes to providing healthcare services. So, um, so I think our voices need to really be amplified to bring that information to, to our relative um, institutions, ministries, and our governments to play their role. They have a responsibility to do so. Um, the, we do have situations where I think as well, um, the young people need to be involved and need to be sitting at the table in these discussions. Very often when you have discussions and uh, around these issues, the young people, the youth voice is missing. How do we get our, our, our governments to understand that the people who understand best their, 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 their issues would be those young people who are bringing their own experiences to the table. We have issues where the teachers in our system are saying that they cannot, they cannot teach comprehensive sexuality education because they're not trained. We have issues where parents are saying they have never been exposed to this type of information and therefore, it is difficult for them to teach their own children the information that they require. Yet, when you go to the table, you hear that parents do not want this education for their children, that teachers do not want to be trained. To, to be trained. This is contradictory and, 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 un, un, and not progressive to, to move the pendulum and to make a, 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 and to bring the issues to the situation where young people can have access. So we have a number of issues, the laws, the willingness of the parties to participate and to recognize the need. The, we also have the opposition, which is very big. Right now we have an, a, a, a movement across the Caribbean that is going from country to country to say to our governments, do not entertain any information on, 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 on comprehensive and se comprehensive sexuality education because what these people are doing is encouraging our young people to become sexually active. Our young people are growing up in the world and they have access to information on the internet. We want to ensure that they have the correct information. So there, so so we are in a in a whirlwind and a, and a tailspin in terms of how do we get our governments to take the lead as their first response to understanding that they are responsible for various aspects of the of the development of young people. I want to give Dennis and Chrisan a chance 
I, I know we haven't uh, touched all of the questions that you raised at the moment, but I would like to give them a chance to also respond, respond to some of those questions. Hi, so um, I, I didn't see Chrisanne, but I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, Madam President, Commissioners, I have the fortunate or unfortunate ability to respond to some of these questions intimately because of my capacity in another space. Um, I can tell you, let me lead with a personal example. I ran the risk a few years ago of being charged under the Children's Act as revised in 2012 for uh, failing to report. I would have known of an incident where there was a 14-year-old girl. Um, both persons, students, were at, at, at a school. Um, they en engaged in some sexual activity, not vaginal penetrative, but some oral sexual activity we found out. Of course, we disciplined them within the context of what we found to be reasonable at the point in time. Um, the male was 19 years old. He was still in fifth form. He had not yet gotten ex results from his CSEC examinations. They were, one was in form three, one was in form five. And I had to go before the Children's Protective Unit for a failure to report requirement under uh, our Children's Act of 2012. We have a suite of legislation in Trinidad and Tobago from the Offenses Against the Person Act last amended 2012 Sexual Offenses Act class amended 2005, the Children's Act class amended 2012. And, but we can't speak from this perspective and discount some of the work that has been done by the state to bring us into alignment with those futuristic goals that, that we need. Um, I can tell you one of those examples is when you go to section 20 of the Children's Act of, of 2012, there is an exemption built, in, built into the legislation that provides what we call a, 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 a window period uh, where a person that is over the age of 15 but under the age of 18, if it is they are not uh, three years older than the, that, than the other person in the situation, they can't be charged once there is no coercion. So th there are some steps that have been taken. Are we saying that we're there yet? The answer is no. Are we saying that we do have a long way to go? The answer is obviously yes. But one of the factors that we must consider is that as a society, Caribbean societies, and I can speak in particular about Trinidad, we do have a significantly conservative sector of our society, which for the most part is fueled by our religious community. Um, I myself am a practicing Christian, However, I understand the need as society changes for us to be agile and adapt to the needs of an evolving society. I remember a case in point when the government in 2016, 2017 uh, was moving to amend the suite of marriage legislation, the Hindu marriage ordinance, the Muslim marriage ordinance, and to uh, now criminalize uh, child marriage on the whole. That was completed in June of 2017. Um, where they would have uh, passed in both houses of parliament and subsequently proclaimed um, new marriage legislation, which makes it an offense to get someone under the age of 18 married in Trinidad and Tobago. So child marriage is no longer a thing in Trinidad and Tobago. Are we saying that it doesn't happen um, in rural communities um, where the eyes of the law don't reach, that's another question. If it's a question of, of enforcement, I, I can't speak to it, but I can say from a legislative position, a lot of work has been done to bring us into, into overall conformity. However, we must acknowledge that our religious community maintains a significant amount of power in our local community, in our local society, um, and they are often the leading voices against change that we're advocating, particularly when we get to the issue of this, the space of LGBT issues, the religious community are, are up in arms. Um, I can tell you particularly when uh, the Jason Jones v. the Attorney General matter was heard and a ruling was brought down in favor of, of Mr. Jones, um, the religious community held press conferences for days calling on the government to reject the decision of the court and to protect our local communities. When in actuality, what we are asking our government to do 
is to continue to marginalize a sector of our society. Um, and, and, and that's very important. Um, if, it is, if it is we were to talk about um, the issue of um, reporting and, 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 and education, I can tell you there are a lot of young people who don't know, they just don't know. I was fortunate recently to participate and speak in, in a program hosted by our Ministry of Sport and Community Development, which focus on empowering men in communities. And having spoken on the issue of sexual health to these young men, so many of them didn't recognize that there were services available. What does that mean? It means that we as civil society, though we've been doing the work, we probably have not been telling the story. And if it is we are telling the story, we probably haven't been telling the story efficiently or, or sufficiently or in the right spaces to get the information out. Yes, we must rely on government to do their part. And yes, their part cannot be trivialized. But we as civil society must continue to do the work that we've been doing for so long because we know it's the work that's necessary for our young people um, to take us where we want to, do, to be. Um, there were so many other questions. There were so many other things that could have been said. But, but what we know is we are sure that there is work to be done. The government has done some, and I think this forum and, and forums such as these provide an opportunity where young people are able to come to the table and put positions forward. And I can tell you uh, from my interaction I had this morning that the government of Trinidad and Tobago actually is listening. Um, they, they are hearing, I think, um, the, our, one our Minister of Foreign and Caricom Affairs has actually told me you'll actually be listening to this presentation today. So there are, when, when we position ourselves um, close enough to those power brokers, we can actually bring about meaningful change. And I, that's what I wanted to leave with the commission today, that though we have far to go, we've come a long way. And only through your continued contribution, through your continued assistance and, and recommendations, can we reach the finish line. So commissioners, Madam President, I thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Sorry, good morning. I will be answering um, the questions that were directed to um, some of the laws that were in place in Jamaica. And specifically, I would like to touch on the Jamaica's abortion laws because according to the ab abortion laws, which is the Offenses Against the Person Act, which was legislated in 1864, the termination, whether by mechanism or drug of a pregnancy that is not meeting the criteria of to save the woman's life, to preserve physical health, as well as to preserve mental health, is deemed illegal in Jamaica. Unfortunately, there is no space according to the policy that puts an area for um, a bit of understanding. For example, how do you quantify whether this pregnancy, the feelings that this mother is um, experiencing during this pre pregnancy is so detrimental to her mental health that it would be in her best interest, therefore preserving her physical health, to um, legislate or allow the termination of this pregnancy. I think therein lies a lot of the hesitancy of healthcare practitioners because there is no set guideline as to what exactly is preserving mental health. For example, there is no set guideline as to what is um, her quality of life. Um, for example, in the story of Candice, as I had shared before, they would see nothing would be physically wrong with Candice. So therefore, her quality of life, it could be argued that her quality of life would not be impaired. However, they're not taking or we're not taking into account the social implications this might have. Will she be able to continue school? Will she be able to have someone to care for her child and care for herself, seeing as she is a child on her own? There is no clear cut um, decisions as it relates to those um, few 
um, policies. For example, rape or incest, if there is a fetal impairment, social or economic um, reason, reasons, as well as just availability of the mother's request, the, all of those criteria are deemed insufficient for abortion in Jamaica. And also specific um, contingencies where the spouse has to be present or um, it has to be verified through a, spe a specialist and then counter verified between another specialist to arrive at a decision on a woman's personal um, well-being. Again, it would be hard to determine whether this pregnancy or any pregnancy would be of detriment to any woman's um, mental health or physical health outside of the obvious um, life-threatening um, situations. I also want to highlight as it relates to the access to contraceptives. Similarly, there is a policy, but unfortunately, the legal framework to su support this is not as clear cut as we would need it to be to allow persons to feel empowered to make use of these resources, to empowered to um, access these services. For example, here in Jamaica, to access the morning after pill, at a pharmacy, first of all, a woman must be the one to purchase it. You have to be female to go into the pharmacy and make a purchase of the morning after pill. You cannot, as a let's say, in a male female partnership, and the male, the female is understandably distraught and has asked her male partner to go to the pharmacy and um, procure a morning after pill so that they can safely and effectively um, handle their situation of unprotected sex. He would be denied, denied access to that method of contraception simply on the grounds that it is only to be used by a woman, as well as the fact that there is a counseling session that must be had between the pharmacist and the woman before the purchase is even made. So yes, there are policies or legislation in place in theory to facilitate the access to these resources as well as um, the services necessary for um, contraception and other aspects of sexual and reproductive health rights, but it is not clear cut. And we, I find, especially in our population, are not well versed in the nuances of what is acceptable versus what is not acceptable. It is not at the forefront of our government officials' discussions or sexual and reproductive health rights is almost an afterthought. Um, something that has been enforced on paper to achieve a certain um, level of quality of life. But is it actually being enforced within the country, within the communities, within the, within the schools? I would say not, seeing as a lot of these situations are <laughs> happening in numerous amounts. There is, there is no shortage of stories of persons who have been unable to access um abortions or who have been denied by healthcare practitioners because they themselves felt uncomfortable seeing as they weren't sure if if the information were to get out how they would be viewed in the eyes of the law how would their medical professions go how would their practice go what would be the legal ramifications of participating in what they feel is an ethical responsibility but legally they are almost at a loss because they're unsure of how to proceed I feel like, um, Madam President and Commissioners, I think what would be best is to implore on our government in officials that these legislation and these policies that they've implemented is not only for show, they must actively work towards better understanding within the community because what is the point of a policy that no one understands? I would be afraid <laughs> to participate or not participate because I'm not sure of where I would fall in a legal framework. So I believe that is I, that is paramount education and understanding of these laws and better accessibility to these laws. Why is it that a document regarding sexual and reproductive health rights, I would have to search a library and search a filing cabinet and search call a librarian from her home to access these resources to even find out the information so the access to information i think is one of the most significant problems that we face here in jamaica and i think um commissioners the best way to get the ball rolling or move in the right direction would be to in increase or implement measures or programs to understand the, even the legal terminologies the framework the policy how exactly persons 
citizens as well as um, youth, healthcare practitioners, all persons, teachers, guidance counselors, how they fall in relation to these policies and how best we can work together to ensure that everyone is on a level playing field and can effectively use these policies where needs, where needs be. Thank you. Commissioners, we, we, I see we just have one minute left in this round. I just wanted to make a very quick comment because we just ended the second Adolescent Congress on, on, um, in, on youth and, and adolescent health in Jamaica. Um, and that's why I'm still in Jamaica to be able to speak from here. Um, and one of the, and what, is, what, is, what, is, what has come out very clearly is that we still have a long way to go. The issue of child marriage was one that was placed on the table, very clearly a round table organized by my own organization, the IPPF Acro Regional Office. And it is clear that there are a number of issues that young people, there's a recent study being done um, and the, prelim the preliminary findings were shared at that round table. And there is quite a lot of work still to be done to educate our young people and um, in, on the issues of child marriage and which they are referring to more as early unions. Young people are still, we still have that as a major situation. So I wanted to say, that um, even in the Adolescent Congress, the issue of, of, of comprehensive sexuality education was a big issue that big young people are crying out and saying that we're still not doing anything about that with the governments. The research is there, the young people are, are talking out, a number of UN agencies have done so. So I know I have to stop now, but I wanted to make reference to that Adolescent Congress um, because there's a lot of material that has come out in, in the last three days that we can definitely share with the commission as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know that there is a lot of information that you have and that you are going to forward that information to us. Uh, we are really thankful for that. Well, I have to say thank you for all the information, but also because when you are, I mean, I'm talking about my personal case, when you are working so long for this issue, sometimes you feel like exhausted. So listening to the young people is hope. So thank you very much for this. You are our hope and we are going to be your hope as well. Um, thinking about the ideas, uh, because uh, Denise mentioned that some of the minister is connected now, listening to the hearing. I hope so. And um, it would be some of the, of the ideas. It would be good to have like a visit with my sisters, uh, Commissioner Arosemena, Commissioner Macaulay, Commissioner Clark, to one or more of the Caribbean countries just for this issue, to talk to the young people, to talk to the young girls. And I will be. It will be good of, of women, Commissioner women. We, we can go there. You know, this is one idea that we could include in our plan as well. I know that Commissioner Hernandez <laughs> could join us. In, 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 invite a male commissioner. Of course. Why not? Of course, of course. All, it would be great. Our work, una uh, visita uh, trabajo, no? I work with whole commissioner. Working with it. Mentioning my colleague now, but of course you, Commissioner Bernal and Commissioner Ramos as well. It would be good to have one country or maybe one or two on these issues. Another thing is um, that I like to share because Dennis mentioned as well the situation of religion, belief. The commission is preparing a report on freedom of religion. We're going to have a hearing soon. And one of the perspectives that I'd like to share with this uh, is um, one declaration that the UN expert has last year about uh, freedom of religion and LGTB. And they say, and I'm going to, to read this, uh, faith tradition teach the need to listen to those who are silenced and uplift those who are oppressed. They ask us to find the common ground in the human experience. They, the religion, urge to embrace others, especially others that are different. Faith motivates many to work tirelessly for the common good by finding life purpose and make a unique contribution to the world. So the experts, and I think that the commission is in the same path, we believe the international human rights framework and the humanistic principle, principle at the core of every religion have an interdependent role. 
to safeguard and promote the inherent and equal dignity of every human being. This is what religion means. This is what freedom of religion and respect uh, for LGTB people, for young girls, for women, this is. So again, thank you very much for this. You will give us a lot of information, a lot of input. You gave us hope. And this is, I know that many people are listening to this hearing. Uh, the commission is here supporting you, listening to you. La Comisión está aquí. Escuchándoles a cada the uno commission is here to listen to you, to hear from you. This is something reciprocal. I'm enjoying this hearing. Thank you. 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 You oh, it was good to hear from you all. Great, a nice day, everyone. You too. Thank you, thank you, thank you.